Well, good morning, and thank you, Professor Annual, for the very uh, kind introduction. And Dean Kreider, thank you for your presence and support and encouragement to participate today. It is uh, good to see all of you and those of you who are joining us on the live stream as well. It's a, a real privilege to participate in this. I uh, commend to you for this uh, colloquium, this emphasis, and uh, I hope that today provides maybe a, an introductory framework for the entire uh, semester. Uh, what we're going to try to do today is uh, to connect uh, two things together. Uh, first of all, we're going to try to connect and show the relationship between theology and worship, and then secondly, to show the relationship between worship and service. So it's those are the two big uh, objectives for today, and then as the professor said, we will um, hopefully have time for a question or two uh, at the end. Ignorance is not bliss when it comes to thinking about God. Theology is the backbone of the church, the foundation for all of life. Theology is either sound or unsound. But good theology always leads to doxology. Christian theology forms the foundation of the church's beliefs, proclamation, worship, and ministry. Christian theology at its most basic form is the study of God and His works. It is thinking rightly about God as our Creator, our providential sustainer and redeemer. Thus, everyone who seriously contemplates the greatness of the Creator God is in some sense a theologian. Our task then is to think rightly about God based on what He has revealed about Himself in His Word, the Bible. Ultimately, it may not matter what we think about sports or the NBA playoffs, your favorite hobby, today's headlines related to politics, but it does matter what we think about God. Thinking rightly about God's greatness and majesty leads us to worship Him aright. It is to that topic, the relationship of theology to Christian worship, that I want to focus our attention during the first half of our time together today. Worship, though primary in the life of the church, is often elusive and misunderstood, even among followers of Christ. Worship, at its most basic level, is ascribing worth to God with our voices, our minds, and our hearts. It is the act and activity of praising and glorifying God, especially when believers assemble together in a local congregation, even virtually during this time of the pandemic. The diversity of worship practices in today's evangelical and Baptist worlds has brought about encouragement for some and confusion and challenge for others. Some churches practice formal worship, with an emphasis on liturgy. Others concentrate on teaching and instruction. Some continue to practice revivalistic styles while others utilize praise emphases or celebration and innovation. Without getting caught up with personal preferences, I want today to focus on our praise and exaltation of God as well as our ministry to others, connecting worship to the service of God. So what then can we learn about the practices of worship in the early church that might help us think about the relationship of theology to worship? Worship is the foundational activity of the Christian church, so claimed W.T. Connor, who taught theology here for four decades. It defines the life-giving functions of the people of the new covenant, both now and in the ages to come. Worship is a joyful experience for the believing community and is as necessary for spiritual life as air and food are for physical well-being. The church that meets us in the pages of the New Testament is a worshiping community of believing men and women. Christian worship arose directly out of a matrix of Jewish traditions in the temple and the synagogue. 
many of the Old Testament patterns and forms were filled with new theological content by the early church, given a new understanding of this new situation in the history of God's saving purposes for the world. Christians of the apostolic era were conscious of living in days of eschatological fulfillment that flowed from the incarnation and redeeming crosswork of Jesus of Nazareth, in whom they recognized Israel's Messiah and the world's Savior. It was this theological conviction that stamped itself on their worship in every aspect and gave it a distinctiveness <clears throat> that is unique. Standing at or near the top of this list of features that mark out Christian worship from its antecedents in the Old Testament, rabbinic Judaism, and from the contemporary world of the Greco-Roman religion is the Christological reality of the crucified, risen, and exalted Christ whose promise to be with His people who assembled in His name was claimed and known. Worship in the New Testament highlighted the importance of believers meeting in accord and in this oneness being promised the divine presence. Worship is portrayed in the scriptures primarily as a vertical movement, but we also see a horizontal movement because worship was and is to be celebrated with others. We sing songs and hymns to and with one another, Ephesians chapter 5. Therefore, worship is to be understood as a community act and the relationships between the members of the worshiping community are to be of the highest importance. For it is a community bound together by faith and love. And this faith and love are grounded in Jesus Christ. Through Christ, the people of God, the community of Christ, responded in thanksgiving, praise, remembrance for the atoning sacrifice offered, in love for the forgiveness of sins and the salvation of humankind. The church's worship, praise, and remembrance make present the reality of Christ's redeeming work for women and men. The worship of Jesus Christ during New Testament times was born in the crucible of events that were recognized as the theological fulfillment of the Old Testament. Initially, the early church's worship evidenced much continuity with Jewish patterns. In this context, the church developed characteristics in continuity with and distinct from Jewish worship. In many ways, following the pattern of Jesus himself, the early church reinterpreted the customs of Jewish worship in light of the person and work of Jesus Christ and the Christian mission that he had given to the church. Every aspect which was theological in its essence. As the church expanded, the worship of the Hellenistic Christians was more and more characterized by the renunciation of Jewish ritualism, Acts chapter 6 and 7, Again, reinterpreting these rituals as having been fulfilled in Christ, Hebrews chapter 7 through 10. By the end of the first century, the church was largely comprised of Gentile Christians who needed instruction in order to be orderly in worship, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 40. Since these believers were coming out of a pagan background, Worship became Christocentric and theologically oriented as preaching, teaching, prayers, and singing, as well as the Lord's Supper, characterized the major aspects of their time together. By the time, by the end of the first century, the church's worship was commonly Christocentric, in that the church worshiped the Father in and through the work of the Son by the Holy Spirit in praise and thanksgiving for the work of redemption. For the work of Christ is central to Christian worship, but it formed its meaning as well. Worship was more than an exercise in memory or a matter of simply recounting past events, dynamically enabling the believing community to experience the presence of Christ in a specific and decided way. For the essence of Christian worship, then, is grounded in the Old Testament revelation, though there are two important theologically rich elements that at the heart of both apostolic precept and apostolic practice. First, 
Christian worship is the active response to God the Father through the Son. The worshipers stand in a personal relationship as sons and daughters of God on the basis of adoption in Christ. Praise, prayer, preaching, the celebration of baptism and the Lord's Supper, confession, the giving of gifts are all Christ-centered actions. The focus of the church's worship on the resurrected and exalted Christ gives a new depth and content that could not be achieved in the Old Testament period. The second factor is that the worship of God through the Son was understood to take place in and by the Holy Spirit. Fitting and acceptable worship can only be offered by and through the enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit. This presentation is being given on the campus of Southwestern Baptist Seminary. And while I recognize that not all of you are Baptist or even Southern Baptist, my focus in this brief section, this point, will turn to an overview of the continuity and discontinuity in Baptist life though there are parallels with several other denominations. Worship in Baptist churches in North America reflects the principal types of worship that were transferred from European soil to the American colonies, though it has been contextualized by regional and ethnic emphases. First, there were those churches that retained a fixed liturgy, such as had been known in the Anglican Church. A second type was characteristic of those churches that stemmed from what might be called radical Puritanism. This form of worship rejected traditionalism and opened the door to the practices of American revivalism. A third type of worship, reflecting many aspects of American culture, de-emphasized the ordinances and highlighted more entrepreneurial practices. Baptists as a whole are not strict traditionalists. That may surprise a few of you, but many congregations still value formal worship practices. Thank the Lord. This formal style emphasizes both beauty and truth, pointing to the aesthetic and to other times to the rational. Prescribed order in traditional or formal worship ensures a balanced concentration on scriptural selections and themes. Worship services are characterized by public scripture reading, congregational responses, hymns, anthems, the offering and preaching. Music is focused on the greatness of God, though there is some variety. The major characteristic of formal worship is order and structure. This approach seeks to find theological and practical connections with believers through the centuries, showing appreciation for and deference to the historical significance of worship through the ages. These worshipers are aware that they are not the first generation to preach the sermons, to sing the hymns, together as a corporate community to worship God. Thus their practices benefit from a continuity with Christians in past times. Another model is more informal, reflecting the influence of revivalism. Many Baptist churches began without church buildings, so worship took on an informality of the home or the schoolhouse and reflects freedom and flexibility that was found in those contexts. Revivalistic worship was characterized by a rather simple pattern of unskilled singing, so even I could have participated, extemporaneous prayer and evangelistic preaching. Through the years, as the frontier pushed westward, traditional worship became more informal as revivalism spread in the 19th and early 20th century. Similar patterns were found among African American congregations, though often with distinctive characteristics. Emotional singing, personal prayers, and special music, often a solo, preceded the sermon to prepare and enable the congregation to hear and respond to the present, to the preacher. The sermon was almost always followed by some form of altar call, 
Such an approach became normative in large portions of Baptist life throughout the 20th century. More recently, more creative worship styles have gained ascendancy among Baptists. Particularly is this the case in larger churches in suburban and metropolitan areas. The worship both informs and entertains the congregation. A major goal of the service is to enable participants to feel comfortable in worship. Sermons are often topical with an emphasis on practical application. Video clips and praise music help to connect those in attendance with the theme of the day. Drama and multimedia presentations are often highlighted with less emphasis on the ordinances and other practices found in the more formal gatherings. Rather than emphasizing participation, this style sometimes sees the congregation more like an audience at an event. While all forms of worship represent some form of contextualization, we should always seek to ground our worship in the teaching of Scripture and in the theological truths that we confess. Learning from the early church models, we should expect variety. Just as some 2,000 years ago, a portion of the church adopted the formal practices of the temple. Others, the teaching patterns of the synagogues, and still others, the informality of meeting house to house. We can say that we must not neglect to teach and preach the whole counsel of God, which Paul said to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20. Nor can we even hint that we are ashamed of the gospel. We need theologically informed worship that exalts the majestic Trinitarian God and also edifies and encourages people. With these points in mind, let us think together about how to bring about theological renewal that might lead to worship renewal in our gathering as believers. At the heart of any concept of worship renewal is the recognition that our worship must first and foremost be God-centered. We need renewal because sadly much of our practice tends to be human-centered. Worship is not primarily for us, but for God, as we recognize His glory and exalt His name. I would like to suggest that we rethink the importance of the reading of Scripture as well as hearing Scripture and the preached Word, that we encourage congregational involvement in praise, prayer, singing, giving, and confession, that we restore the ordinances, particularly the Lord's Supper, to a place of priority for sanctification and spiritual formation. We must acknowledge that many in our congregations, and sometimes even we ourselves, tend to be confused about the purpose and order of worship, that we tend to evidence a minimal use of the Bible, especially its public reading, that we tend to be passive and that we tend to devalue the ordinances. I believe that these things have happened because of one or more reasons. Number one, people come to church expecting to be entertained and to have their needs met. Number two, the Enlightenment over the past many decades has created an overemphasis on the rational element of worship. Number three, revivalistic emphases in some quarters have created an unbalanced emotionalism while focusing the gathered church toward unbelievers. And number four, because of the influence of secularization in our churches, has diminished the difference between the Christian community and the world. The combination of these various trends has created an unwelcomed situation. And it is in this situation that theologically informed worship should stand at the heart of our gathering as believers. Unfortunately, it is being pushed aside by some of these trends, leaving us with practices that are unable to form, shape, challenge, inspire, enhance, motivate, nourish, and feed us for the long term. 
we must again recognize the importance and priority of worship for the church corporately and for our lives individually. We must help people recover the focus of worship, which should be upon the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We come together to acknowledge who God is, to thank Him for what He has done for us, and to ask Him to continue to work in us for His glory and the good of the church. Thus we bless Him, we sing praises to Him, we offer our gifts to Him in active participation. Such a mindset helps us overcome the misconception that the music, the hymns, the prayers, the readings, the offering are merely preliminaries for the sermon or that the ordinances are something that we tack on at the beginning or the ending of the service. All of these things are important to recognize, but what is essential is that we understand that Christian worship is primarily rooted in an event the Christ event, in which God revealed Himself as our loving and compassionate Creator and Redeemer. Christian worship at its heart is our Holy Spirit-enabled response to the birth, ministry, death, resurrection, and exaltation of Jesus Christ. We recognize that genuine worship is only possible in and by the Holy Spirit who prompts our love and praise of God. At the same time, we need to rediscover the resources available to us to help us highlight these symbols, resources that have been handed down to us by Christ, the apostles, and the experiences of the communion of saints through the ages. I believe that so much that has been dismissed as form and tradition can be rebaptized by the Spirit of God to reshape and revitalize our congregational worship. And thanks be to God, I see that starting to take place in some places as we move beyond what some have called the worship wars. To be faithful to the New Testament, I believe we must retrieve the significance and the importance of the Lord's Supper. The regular observance of the supper will enhance our love for the Lord. A greater love for the Lord will form the foundation for reaching others with the love of Christ. As an infrequent practice or a hurried appendage to the sermon, we fail to give the supper the time or priority that has been given to it by believers throughout the centuries. In doing so, we must not give up our evangelistic zeal or our growing sense of the importance of edification. Certainly, we need balance in all of these things. But still, I would like to urge us to explore afresh the meaning and significance of the supper. For nothing is able to help us celebrate the work of Christ in our behalf or enable us to experience His presence among us, as does the regular observance of the supper. It enables the Word to become visible while emphasizing unity in our churches, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, and 17. We must also help people realize the need to prepare for worship. For worship leaders need to structure services to have coherent movement that is theologically, biblically, and thematically informed. We want to encourage worshipers not just to sit, listen, be informed, but to participate actively as they exalt God and affirm their faith. If we are truly concerned with ascribing supreme worth to God with our voices, our minds, and our hearts, that He alone is worthy to receive, we must be cautious about allowing our worship to be shaped by our felt needs rather than by Scripture and a healthy appreciation for the Christian heritage. Thus, our songs must be less about our feelings and more about who God is and what He has done for us. The focus of the church's worship on the exalted Christ gives us spirit-enabled depth and content to a gathering. As we have noted, fitting and acceptable worship can only be offered by and through the enabling ministry of the Holy Spirit. 
So in our remaining minutes together, I want to ask this last question. How then can we connect head, heart, and hands? How can we think about the relationship of theology to worship and worship to service? When genuine worship takes place, the entire body of Christ is enhanced and built up. Moreover, the mission, service, and outreach of local churches will be strengthened. There's an important first-person piece in uh, Baptist Press this week uh, by a friend sitting to my right that is worthy of your uh, contemplation if you've not seen it. But some of the things that I'm going to say uh, follow uh, some ideas that I read uh, from him uh, this week. The people of God who have worshipped him and who have mutually strengthened will be prepared to enter the world to touch lives, to meet needs, to counsel hurts, to speak to injustices and bear witness and proclaim the saving message of the gospel. Renewal in our worship will refocus an emphasis on the importance of all things being done for the glory of God. We will begin to move away from our individualistic emphases to connect the whole body so that all things will be done for mutual edification, 1 Corinthians 14, 26. This mutual upbuilding of the body involves the development of mutual relationships. This takes place as each member, enhanced by congregational participation, ministers the gift that has been bestowed to him or her by the Holy Spirit. Edification takes place in sharing with and thus mutually receiving from others. True worship produces such interaction and freedom of the Holy Spirit. When genuine worship takes place, not only is the entire body built up and strengthened, but the mission and outreach of the church will be rekindled and extended. So let's think about these from four different biblical passages. One in the Old Testament, three in the New. Notice that in Isaiah chapter 6, after the prophet had authentically encountered God as high and holy and lifted up as the holy, 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 that three things resulted. A fresh recognition of who God is, a realization of the need for repentance and forgiveness, and thirdly, a renewed desire and availability for service. Here am I, Lord, send me. Isaiah couldn't get his hand up fast enough. Notice in a similar manner that when the disciples of the resurrected Christ saw Jesus in Matthew chapter 28, that they first worshipped him. In the midst of their worship, the Lord then commissioned them to disciplize the nations. Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. This commissioning pattern is repeated in a worship service at the church in Antioch in Acts chapter 13. While the church is worshiping and praying, the Holy Spirit descends upon them to set apart Barnabas and Paul for mission service to the Gentiles. And in Revelation 4 and 5, the Apostle John describes God as sitting on His throne in all of His majestic splendor, surrounded by the heavenly beings who are singing to God day and night. They proclaim in song, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And worthy are you, our Lord and our God. In chapter 5, Jesus Christ, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of Jesse, is the only one worthy to open the scroll that would establish His right to rule the kingdom of God. And in Revelation chapter 9, the angels and the elders gather to sing a new song. The rest of the book of Revelation shows God's plan for humankind and the responses of God's people in praise, which is then followed by service, witness, and even martyrdom for some. In all four of these passages, we find similar things. That God reveals Himself, that He invites people to worship Him, that people encounter God and in response to the Word of God confess their sins and acknowledge their need of Him, 
the people of God who have worshipped their God and who have been mutually strengthened by God's word are then prepared to enter the world, to touch lives, to meet needs, and proclaim the saving message of the gospel. Reaching people and exalting God are hardly in conflict. As a matter of fact, real outreach is prefaced upon genuine worship and is focused on the church, the culture, and the world. So as we conclude, let's think together about the relationship of theology, worship, and service in these three spheres, church, culture, and world. God gives, gives His people in the church in order to enable them for service so that they will be strengthened and prepared for faithful living and ministry. The Spirit of God uses gifted leaders in the church to help bring maturity to others. They, in turn, will be able to proclaim Christ, admonishing and teaching others with great wisdom, ready to engage the culture and to serve the world through both word and deed. Many people today reject the church or the Christian faith not so much because they perceive it to be false, but because they believe it to be superficial or trivial, largely because our theological confession tends also to be shallow and superficial. People are looking for an integrated way of seeing life that brings coherence to all of life's experiences, some of which we have to acknowledge are quite painful and confusing for many people. In many ways, our post-Christian Western culture resembles the pre-Christian Athens of Paul's day in Acts chapter 17, particularly its interest upon the new, the novel, and the world of change as emphasized by the Epicureans. Our culture is similarly enthralled by the new and the novel, amusing ourselves to death, in the words of Neil Postman. The cultural trends that shape so much of our society are similarly influenced by the rise of neo-paganism and various and diverse forms of spirituality. Thus, Scripture remains a true, insightful, and reliable guide to enable thoughtful Christ followers to respond to this ever-changing postmodern and post-Christian world in which we find ourselves. We must engage in the serious work that seeks then to connect theology, education, worship, cultural engagement, spirituality, evangelism, missions together as partners rather than competitors. In many ways, this is the vision of President Greenway for one Southwestern. We need a fresh vision for what brings believers together. It is not our personal preferences or our cultural affinities, but our deep love for Jesus Christ and our shared Christian beliefs in the triune God who has made himself known to us. Our lives then are to become an offering of thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ, which is expressed in our convictional faith in Christ, as well as our compassion for the least of these in the world. So let us assume a posture of humility, which comes from learning to see ourselves aright, in light of God's greatness as we exalt Him in worship. Such humility will open the way for us to learn afresh from God, His Spirit, and from one another. A love for Jesus Christ and a desire to understand others will help to counter the fear that characterizes so much of the church today. Countering this fear will be an important step to launching new global ministries for the days ahead. We thus seek to know and exalt God, to think seriously and coherently about all aspects of life in order to serve others and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So let us not shy away from this task. 
Let us ask the Lord to raise up and develop a new generation like you and those who will come after you who will be theologically informed, committed, convictional, and courageous Christ followers who will go forth in wisdom, humility, and confidence to serve the church, to engage the culture, to disciplize the nations, to take the gospel to the world for the glory of a triune God. We pray for the Lord to give us open eyes and hearts to comprehend the important connections between knowing God, thinking rightly about God, exalting God, and serving God, recovering the significance and vitality of robust theology, genuine spirituality, authentic biblical and spirit-enabled worship, for our lives individually and primarily for the church corporately, leading to faithful, God-honoring service, all for the glory of our great and majestic God. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, so I remember that moment with you when we were talking about um, the Lord's Supper. Um, it's been a joy and honor to be able to serve at a Baptist church locally here. But we all know who the Lord's Supper and what He's like to do. And that's something that kind of hurts my heart because I agree with you that that is a, a function and um, an ordinance, we call it, um, that we need. Um, so what would be a suggestion you might have as how much can I serve my pastor in a loving way? Um, maybe begin by thinking carefully about 1 Corinthians chapter 11 uh, because it assumes that when they gather, it is for the Lord's Supper. Four times in that chapter, beginning at verse 17 and following, it says, when we gather, when we gather, when we gather, when we gather, and it is all focused around the supper. So it was assumed that that would take place. In Acts chapter 20, verse 7, the famous uh, story where uh, Paul is preaching and the guy goes to sleep and falls out the window, which is comfort to those of you who have people fall asleep on you while you're preaching. (laughs) But Acts chapter 20, verse 7 doesn't say, when they came together to hear the apostle Paul preach. It said, when they came together, it's a purpose clause in the Greek text, in order to break bread. When they came together to break bread, then Paul took that as an opportunity to speak to them. So the purpose of their gathering was for the Lord's Supper. Or there's not a Baptist preacher in the world that doesn't love Charles Spurgeon. (laughs) And Charles Spurgeon did not always practice it, but said that every week, if it were up to him, that the believers would gather together around the Lord's Supper. So start with Scripture. But go to Spurgeon. He's, you can't, you can't, you know, you can never refute Spurgeon if you're a Baptist. So uh, those would be some guides, I would think. Um, I don't think it's, I don't think the New Testament requires us to partake of the supper every week. But it does call for frequent participation in the supper, and twice a year is not frequent. So hope that helps. Yes, sir. Where do you, um, where do you go to church, and what is worship? Well, I have lived in uh, Fort Worth for all of seven weeks. And uh, (laughs) so mostly I have been online the last seven weeks uh, because I am 67 years old with a heart condition, so I'm pretty careful about some of these uh, uh, issues that we're currently facing. But uh, I have been a part of a church that uh, I'll talk about church turn the clock back several years when I was a pastor of a church in uh, Brooklyn, New York at the Metropolitan Baptist Church. Uh, We had the Lord's Supper at least once a month and we devoted the entire Sunday night gathering on the first Sunday of every month to just participation of the supper where we could do it slowly, take our time, reflect upon the meaning of the bread, reflect upon the meaning of the cup, 
reflect upon what it means for us to do this together, to give time for confession of sin, and to see how the Lord would lead us to respond, to use the time to sing hymns together so that music and the supper uh, come together as ways to lead us not just to individual worship but to, to corporate worship. So I've looked for churches uh, since that time who would seek to follow some kind of pattern that would emphasize the importance uh, uh, of the supper. But I confess that uh, my tenure in Fort Worth this time, uh, I've not personally been to a, to a worship service yet. Though I did watch South Hills, Travis Avenue, and First Baptist Benbrook all online this past Sunday. So uh, as far as the uh, actual church you pastored, um, what was it like there? The, the, time, the time of music and worship. Yeah. The music uh, was v vitally important. It was, a t it was a time both for us to participate congregationally as well. I, I still think there is a place for a choir that can lead a church uh, or, or at least a music group if you don't want to have a, a choir. So I think there's, I think there's a place for uh, to have music that does not require everyone to participate. But most of the music should be participatory uh, because just as 1 Corinthians chapter 11 relating to the Lord's Supper says that when we come together, it is to do something. It is to break bread. To Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, talks about uh, when we come together to exalt God, we come to offer something. So worship is not necessarily receiving something, though it does have, we do receive something but we come with the motivation to offer something. We offer ourselves, we offer our praise, we offer our gifts uh, to, to God, and we can do that musically as, as well as uh, other ways. So yes, there is this vital, vital connection. Yes, sir. What is what? What is the bulwark? Oh. Yeah, and like, yeah. you look at music and <laughs> some of us, it's kind of, we don't understand it. But at the same time, I've also seen to older churches that, I mean, like they're, it, you don't get anything out of people for their worship. They're just going to sit there and, you know, aren't engaged. Right. So, so I, 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 think there, I think there is a way to connect them both. Mm -hmm. And I think that is, you know, I, I, I may be stepping on some toes here, so I'm, uh, I, I, I told Professor Annual he can get up here and correct anything I s s say, and the <laughs> dean can get up. Uh, but you know, <laughs> the dean can come and say anything he would like at any moment. So I, I yield to, to both of them. But I, I think that when we have a, a church that has traditional music at nine, and then you know contemporary music at ten thirty, and something else at the noon that we wind up not with a church, but with three different churches. So I think we're better off bringing people together, learning from one another, practicing uh, deference to those in our midst. It, it's, a, it's a way to live out Romans chapter 14, uh, to think of others, you know, Philippians chapter two, think of others as more important than ourselves. It's not our personal preference that matters here. It's the body and how we participate together. And this can be a way to link generations because usually when churches come together now, you've got Generation Z, Millennials, Gen Xers, Boomers, Builders, and th they all have some difference of style and preference and things that were important during you know, their formative uh, years. But we, we need to learn to, to learn from one another, not just you know, say that everybody has to yield to, to one particular uh, approach. This is, you know, this is not a time to, to, for personal preference to be the order of the day. It's, it's a time for the good of the body to be what is ultimate.
about what you see as the impact of watching online a lot of what you're talking about and maybe how we can help our congregation yeah. not see themselves as an audience and resource that's going to take one side, even in the midst of what we're going through right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that online should be the norm long term. I give thanks that we have it so that, we, you know, we're not shut out right right now. And, and there are many congregations that are very comfortable coming back to meet uh, together. And some individuals, you know, are at a different stages and places in, in life. I mean, we even had that here. You know, it, some faculty members aren't coming to f- campus except when they have to teach their class and they're, they're away because they don't want to expose themselves to, you know, to it. And it may be the same for, for students a, as well. So I think we have to give a lot of grace right now. This is a difficult time and an, an unusual time. And we pray that its precedent will not be repeated anytime soon. So wh- what we want to see is that this is a good fill-in. You know, this, this, is, this, is, this is an, an option that we use uh, out of necessity. Uh, but it, we don't want this to become the the norm where uh, and it is something I fear frankly I I fear that 25% of the church may not come back uh, which is um, uh, uh, should be a great concern for all of us I use I use a quick illustration I know our time is running out but uh, it lifeguards tell us that anytime there is a shark attack in the water and people see it people come out of the water they come on the shore that as soon as the all clear is given that maybe 25 percent will get back in the water and then a couple of hours later after that group watches the first people in another 25 percent will go in and the next day another 25 percent will co- come but there are 25 percent who will sit on the beach for the rest of their life because of what they saw they were so traumatized by it and i'm afraid that there could be 25 percent of the church who have been traumatized by this or who have become comfortable with the online that may not come back and that will not be healthy for the church long term so we need to stress we need to give thanks for technology for this in between moment that allows us to have something rather than nothing but remind everyone this is not the norm for the long